everyone. This is another Freedom to Feel conversation, and my guest today is Dr. Christine Silverstein. She is a peak performance coach, founder of Summit Center for Ideal Performance. She is a behavioral health registered nurse and clinical hypnosis expert. Dr. Christine is also a researcher, historian, and bestseller author. Her current book is the one that we'll be discussing today. It's titled Wrestling Through Adversity, Empowering Children, Teens, and Young Adults to Win in Life. So this is my brief introduction to you, Christine. Now, a question that I love asking my guests, all of them from the get-go, it's one of my favorite questions for some reason. Um, in your own words, who is Christine? Well, I have definitely given that a lot of thought in my life. And I believe I was born to do the work that I'm doing now. Mm. And it happened early in childhood. Uh, I was very independent. I remember standing in a vacant lot down the street uh, from my home. And I had an argument with my little brother and my parents were siding with him. So I went to this vacant lot and I remember talking to myself and saying, I have to do everything myself. I'll, I'll have to be very independent in my life. And I was five years old, you know, and I remember going home and telling my parents from then on, leave me alone. I'll do it myself. And they would kind of smile at me and permit me to be independent. And so that's the person I was very early on. And I have carried that through throughout my life, actually, to where I am now. Um, where I, I look at things from a different perspective, and I also um, look at diff in different ways than most people. And I understand my world through metaphors and pictures, mm, yes. and I have to um, spend a lot of time talking to people and, and saying what, what these images and pictures mean um, and the metaphorical aspects of it. So that's who I am, and I started my life off as a nurse, a student nurse at the age of 16. So I was pretty much set very early on in my life how to care for people. Mm, yes. Wow. That's wonderful to hear. You know, this, um, uh, let's say the concept of independence, um, mm. which I have, of course, my own ideas, but I would love to hear more about that for those who are listening, even for myself as well. What is the nature of being independent? It's not really about not um, needing others, right, um, Christine? Mm -hmm. What would mm -hmm. that, what, what does it look like when it comes to communities, uh, relating relationships? What the, I would love to hear a little bit more so we have a bad idea, so I have a bad idea. Well, you can put it into perspective for uh, today's world, and I say in my book that we need to be independent practitioners mm. of our own mental health, and that is because we can't depend on the government to take care of us, and we can't depend on the politicians to take care of us, and we have to know what to do. We have a situation here where our children are afraid to go to school because they, they might be um, shot at with, you know, a, a, a a gun, a automatic um, yeah. rifle. And we have um, situations with our teenagers now who have a lot of depression and anxiety. And also uh, we have our uh, young adults who are having issues as well. 60% like of college students go to their first year s stating that they have mental disorders. So that's a huge amount of, of students um, that are already starting off college that way. So True. I say independent in that we, as parents or adults, we have to help our children through helping ourselves first, because we have to know about our own traumas. We have to know how to handle things and then show them in what's happening in the world. Um, we're not showing our children to be independent in that way. Yeah. So if they, they have these ideas, these, I call them mindful toughness skill sets incorporated, incorporated into how they know the world, then it's not so much of a challenge when, when they go to school and they're being bullied and they know what mm -hmm. to do right there. Yes. Um, but if we wait and they don't know what to do, that's when the coping uh, strategies need to be ramped up for sure. But why not start early on in life? That's the premise that I work with. Start early on mm. because our children learn from 
their parents and from teachers and coaches yeah. um, by a mechanism in the brain called mirror neurons. They right. pick up everything we say, everything we do, even the way we speak, the cadence, everything that's there, they're picking up. And some say, like a cell biologist, he wrote about it um, many years ago, that children pick up vibrations from their parents mm. before they're even conceived. Bruce Lipton, Bruce Lipton, that's his name, <laughs> but he's a famous yeah, um, you mentioned in the book. Yes, author. Mm -hmm. so, so we have to be very careful and teach them to be independent, yet work with communities. So we're all independent and we're working together. Yes. So you're still independent. Look how you're, you have this show that's very independent, I would say. Mm, yes, thank you for saying that, Christine. <laughs> Yeah, because well, sometimes it's kind of confusing, kind of trying mm -hmm. to balance this innate desire to connect with other mm -hmm. human beings, you know, and deeply mm -hmm. connect with them and be mm -hmm. loved and be loved. But at the same time, kind of having our own voice and, you know, this is what I want to do. And um, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if it, other people don't behave the same. They don't do these things. I want to do it. That's more like uh, this. It's self-knowledge, isn't it? It's going within, mm -hmm. getting to know ourselves intimately. Yes really well. Yes, that's a very large aspect of it. You have to be introspective. And you would be surprised how um, young people can learn these skills. I have worked with young people for 27 years yeah. at, at, in my work. And the teenagers in particular are so open to learning about themselves and what to do and how to mm. win because of the development of their brains and the linkages between the left and the right, right um, side of the brain so uh, so I tell them okay so let's look into this let's look into that and they look into their past traumas which they do have even at young ages mm -hmm. yeah. and and they release them and they're so happy to be free and to release the skills automatically especially the athletes yeah in the book it's incredible how much you cover when it comes to healing mm -hmm. and um, performance in the sense of um I love the way you say winning in life in a sense of the independence in, in the way that you speak of yes yeah that's beautiful that you've done that but that it didn't surprise me because you work with young adults to uh, teenagers so you have to be introspective to work with young adults and you have to be able to empathize and put yourself in their places Otherwise, yeah. uh, they'll, they'll, they'll pick it up right away that you're mm. not connecting. Right. You have to develop trust on the right. first visit. And they, ha they have to trust you as well. But I have to trust them that they'll follow through. Mm. Yes, right. I see this mutual kind of um, mm -hmm. understanding, right? Dance. Yes. Um, I have this open question for you about, uh, before we talk about your book, I have so many questions here. Um, what is your, uh, let's say, definition for mental health? What is to be mentally healthy? From your perspective well the the system that we have in the u.s and in some countries around the world although they're they're beginning to see the light of, of what yeah. mental illness is and, and mental health but from my perspective you you have challenges in life you don't have um, a mental illness because you might have depression that um, you know, at some time in your life, you're like your child died and you have depression extending into your life. But the fact is that you became resilient. What did you do after mm -hmm. that? And how did you help people knowing what you learned, you know, from that experience? And that is a definition for some people like a Dr. Stanley Greenspan, who wrote about that in, at the end of the 20th century. Empathy is the most important thing mm -hmm. for people to have. And if you don't have it, then he describes you as having a mental disorder uh, beyond the, the diagnostic statistical manual right. where it states that you have this or that. It's a list of symptoms that you can check off and see how long you've had it. Right. I don't know if it extends beyond six weeks or two months, then you have it, you know, but life is it's a continuum. So mm -hmm. um, so to teach children empathy, and by the way, that's one of the um, skill sets of someone who's emotionally intelligent, a high EQ, emotional um, quotient. So, so I think that's the most important thing. And it is described by a certain um, developmental um, psychiatrist that way. But we've gotten into this idea about the, mm -hmm. the manual and how we fit into that. 
and lay people now talk about it. I have this because I have this symptom of that. And really, it's all about mm. prevention. It's all about a wellness rather than illness. And it goes beyond Descartes, who was a 17th century philosopher who said the mind and body are separate. And we still have that medical model. Um, so you go mm. to the physical health care center and you go to the mental health care center and they never meet in the middle with, with people, body, mind and spirit and emotion has to be dealt with because that's the fourth level of healing. Mm. Oh, wow. Yes, Christine. Uh, I couldn't. I mean, I have to say I agree a billion percent with empathy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And that, um, I guess, the reason why to it, because it goes back to mm -hmm. connection connecting yes. to ourselves and then coming from a, a place of um, authenticity in a sense of vulnerability, no, knowing our own fragilities and limitations. Yes. That automatically connects me with myself because I feel mm -hmm. empathetic mm -hmm. towards the, the human experience of body, mind here. And then that expands to others. Then I can see that easily in other people yes. by having this connection within myself. Yes, absolutely. Well, if you, th you think about filling up your heart, yeah. Um, with like gasoline or fuel, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you right. have to fill your own up before you give some away. Right. And that's a really big challenge for women ah, um, in particular, yeah. um, because that's how you get depleted of all your energy and all your worth and all your value. You're always giving out, but you're never replenishing yourself. Ah, it's so true. Um, that's a very good point. What is your suggestion for women? Um, what would be the first step for those trying to get to this state of um, connectivity with themselves and self-love, uh, self-empathy, what advice would you give? Well, I think the techniques that I use are very mm -hmm. helpful. And I'm sure that before you started your work on, on podcast, you reflected back and no. so what do I wanna do? But also you started to see the vision of yourself Mm. being a host on a podcast yes. <laughs> and that's the very first step and we do not use it wisely if you think about it when you in college and you're having all challenges you know when you're you were a young adult you had to see the picture of yourself graduating so that you actually would graduate yeah. because you move in the, in the direction of your dominant thought and pictures so even though it doesn't feel like it, like you're going to make it, you have to start imagining. And that's the easiest thing in the world to do. So, and it's yeah. free, you know, it's, it's, it's something that's innate within your own mind. So you first start to see yourself, you know, winning that championship or passing that exam or graduating from college. And then you move in that direction and that's the law of attraction. So if, if it's very negative, you'll move in a negative direction because the subconscious mind doesn't make a judgment about uh, you. So whatever you're thinking, I'm going to fail that test or I'm going to pass that test. As Henry Ford once said, you're right, <laughs> you know, either way. Whatever mm -hmm. you, yeah, you believe in and you think you're right. Yeah, mm -hmm. true. Wow. Well, you see, this is a very um, insightful suggestion. I guess for some of us who have experienced um, severe trauma, was my case, I had a hard time kind of visualizing anything that was positive or anything that was that I wanted to accomplish because uh, I had these repetitive thoughts. They would just repeat um, mm -hmm. it's on a cycle. They just would keep coming back. It's almost like blocking imagination. And then something happened where I could see it, a thought that I, I thought it was not even mine. I could not even connect that with my own mind mm -hmm. because I w couldn't mm -hmm. recognize it's my own. I was able to imagine, to visualize something else mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I could mm -hmm. never, you know, done before. So I guess speaking from that perspective as a trauma, uh, I would say thriver, not survivor. <laughs> it's yes. um, that's, that's something else, right, Christine? It's a little mm -hmm. bit beyond because most people can imagine, can visualize people who have not been, people with complex PTSD, which was my case. So, yeah, talk to me about yes. that. Yes, well, it, it relates back to what we were speaking about earlier and that if it starts at a young age, right. you can incorporate this. So you know, like to use mental rehearsal, 
because yeah. it's natural for children, but very often we're discouraged from doing that. When I was in grammar school, my teachers always told my mother I had ants in my pants. There was something wrong with me. But I had a great imagination, <laughs> yeah. right? I had a great imagination. And they'd say, oh, she's always imagining. Yes. <laughs> Never did they think that I would do the work I'm doing now, right? And so I saw that as a benefit and and because that's how I saw my world. And so yeah. if you start young enough, you can ima- you can allow yourself to imagine. And some people have so much trauma that they can't imagine. For instance, I was working with an anesthesiologist. He was a he worked with children and he was so excellent. But he was having challenges passing his his board exams. And he had to pass them. He took them eleven times and he uh-huh. failed. And so when I was working with him, I knew that there was something very deep because he'd tell me, but I can't imagine myself passing the test, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and I'd say, okay, okay, we'll try yeah. again. But he ended up failing the next time. But then there's another doctor I work with, a surgeon, and he was this wonderful surgeon who's so empathetic and very mm-hmm. highly skilled. You know, I had the surgeon hands and he had taken his exam three times and failed. But we Uh went back in time with what I call looking back to the future. And he saw himself when he was a young child in the fifth grade. And he was standing there with his parents, with the teacher telling his parents that he was really dumb and he wouldn't make anything of himself. He'd he'd never do well in life. And so all of a sudden that image came and we worked with it to release it automatically. And very simply, I I used what's called the affect bridge technique. And and then I built them up for the studying of the exam, the prep and the mindset and the positive self-talk and all the things, plus, of course, the technical material. And he went to his exam. He said he felt like he was going out to play a game of golf, you know, oh, <laughs> having, yes. having some fun. And, and he passed the test and he also got the residency that he wanted in New York City. So he was very happy with that. And he didn't have any idea it was related to what was said about him when he was younger. So, so we, we take these things forward and we believe as children, we believe our parents and adults and what people say about us. And I've seen this so many times, like an 11th grader telling me, you now he, he was a wrestler and he was telling me that, oh, he didn't think he could go to college because, um, you know, he couldn't read. And I'm saying, what? <laughs> You're in the 11th grade. So he told me the story of, he was a twin he had a mm. sister who was born like five seconds before he was. And she was very smart. And they always evaluated the two of them together. And being a girl, she was she matured faster. So at any rate, mm-hmm. she went ahead and she was bright and smart and got all the accolades. And he was the dumb one who got left back yeah. and, um, you know, was told that he couldn't read. So now in the 11th grade, he's still believing this. And he wanted to be a police officer, I believe, but you have to pass the test, you know, for that. So at any rate, I said, so what's your favorite subject? And he said it was math. Mm. So I said, well, in the 11th grade, don't you have word problems where you have to read the you have to read the question to answer it? And he said, yes. And I said, well, that's reading (laughs) and you're comprehending. I said, I think you should go home and think about this. You know, mm-hmm. and, and just look back to when this started and, and think about, well, perhaps you can read. So the next week he came back and he, it was a revelation to him. Oh, I don't know what I was thinking. I can read, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. And so it opened a whole new wor- world for him. Besides, he won some wrestling matches while he was at it. <laughs> right. Gosh. You see, that shows the importance of um, the healing work, right? I have interviewed a lot of uh, hypnotherapists. It's mm-hmm. the same thing, right, Christine? Hypnotherapy and hypnosis, or they are different somehow? Well, it, it's how you term it. Um, hypnotherapy implies that there's therapy for something. I, yes. I like to call it hypnosis, self-hypnosis, actually. Right. Because I believe all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. Yes. So I work with that, and I teach my clients how to get in the zone um, using their own mind power. But at first, I show them what to do by what I say, and I record my sessions, and then my voice becomes their voice eventually. 
And, and so that's how they help themselves. So we help our children to help themselves rather than telling them do this or do that. Or when I was your age, I did this and that um, because you're not empathizing with your children when you do that. Right. Yeah. I love that approach. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's empowering because that's yes. what, it's you being a guide in a, a just a absolutely. Teacher. I want to talk about your book. Um, so you wrote a book titled Wrestling Through Adversity. Uh, empowering children, teens, and young adults to win in life. What was the main purpose of writing the book? Well, the main purpose was to show people there's something that they can do to help them, ch their children, to help themselves, as we talked about, as independent yeah. practitioners. And the reason, th there were many reasons why I wrote it. I was inspired by people who, one particular wrestler, I read his book, Wrestling with Life, and he was at the World Trade Center when it was during the terrorist attack. And he had been a wrestler in his previous life. And he was also working in finance, Merrill Lynch. Um, um, and he didn't have the same um, build as the other people who went to Harvard. He didn't go to the same schools, the elite schools. And he... Um, he had like a wrestler's body, like no chin, you know, big <laughs> muscles. Yes. And so, but the thing that Phil had was he said the truth. He had a very good analytical mind. So he was there at the morning when the attack started. He had just come out of the gym that was in the building in the World Trade Center. And he was just sitting down for a moment and doing a little meditation uh, yeah. when, when the, the first attack occurred. And he tells his story in his book of how he ran out of the building and he had to run so fast. But fortunately, he had his sneakers on because um, he had just come out of the gym and he felt sorry for the people who had their dress shoes and high heels on mm. and, and they weren't conditioned like he was. So he could run fast, but still he got all the black smoke and it felt like shards of glass in his lungs as he breathed in. And he did mm. live through that experience, but died subsequently from cancer that riddled his body but he wrote this wonderful book talking about his life and his goal of becoming a coach and he inspired me when i read that um, i saw wrestling of course as a metaphor for how to live your life how to wrestle through adversity in other words mm. and to win and so yeah. that was one thing and then also i began to see all the news on the tv about the shootings in school about this little girl in Uvalde who um, was shot so badly, was uh, her body was disintegrated, literally. So her parents had to identify her by her sneakers. She wore to school that day. That's all that was left. And, and then I saw other stories of the teenagers being locked up in emergency rooms with depression and suicidal ideation, and that there are no programs for them. And then I read about the college athletes committing suicide. And it kept on building up and building up. So, oh my gosh, Christine, you have to write a book because I know there are ways you can help your children to help themselves. And it's never too late to start, mm -hmm. right? Even yeah. if it happens in college, uh, it's never too late because um, even with epigenetic changes in the body caused by behavioral changes or in the environment, you can reverse it because it's not damage to the DNA. It's just changes the way the DNA works. So there's always hope and it's always reversible. And so we have to remember that when we're feeling depressed and, and want to commit suicide, because this is always reversible, even though at the moment it doesn't seem that way. So I was inspired to write it because of that. I could not tolerate it because I know something that can help people and therefore, I just had to write about it, and it just flowed out of me. Oh, my goodness. And it was challenging at times, especially when I was talking about the suicides of five uh, college athletes and what provoked, and there were no red flags, and what can we learn from it? Because that's always the point that I make. And to become resilient, you need to learn from these lived mm. experiences. I know you speak of the power of the mind. I always go back to the spirit you just you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, mind, body, yeah. spirit. Uh, for mm -hmm. me, that has been the anchor. That has been, mm -hmm. it's almost like I had to look from a, a 
place of wholeness, a place of completeness mm -hmm. in order to explore the fragmented parts of the human experience of mm -hmm. body mind. So I would love to hear from you about what is your idea of spirituality? Like how, I mean, what do you do to be it's highly spiritual? <laughs> That's how it just resonates that way. I think it, it comes from my early education. When I look back to when I was five years old and I went to Catholic school, I was in the first grade and I was very young and very tiny. And so we'd have to go to the Sunday mass, 915 mass yeah. um, every, every week. And the thing was the older students, the eighth graders who are now my teenagers, they would sit in the front near the pulpit mm -hmm. and the younger students sat in the back of the church. And I happened to be under the choir loft and it was really dark there and you couldn't see anything in oh. front of you except yeah. you could hear the voice of, of the, of the preacher. And so one day, the pre I heard the preacher, well, he was telling these wonderful stories. I had no idea they were in the Bible. I just thought they were great stories and I'd listen. And one day he said, God is light. He's, he's everywhere, right? So the only thing I could communicate with was the chandelier that I could see from the pew. Yeah. So I used to pray to the chandelier when I was five years old. <laughs> yes. And, you know, I had that, that idea of spirit. But I... Since I was brought up in this way, I was very connected. And one yeah. of the things is, is the name my, that my mother gave me. Um, my mother was converted to Catholicism when she was about 10 years old. And she worked very hard to send me to Catholic school. She was a waitress. And sometimes she would just, uh, people would just throw pennies at her for her tips. Mm -hmm. But she, yeah. she was resolved to send us to, uh, to elementary school, to Catholic school. And so I... I valued that uh, uh, much more later on in my life. But she told me um, before she died one time, uh, she was in a, a hospital. And had, she had just had surgery on her femur that was fractured, and she had a titanium rod put in her leg. And three days, a couple of days later, she was sitting in the chair near the bed. She wasn't eating very much. And I said, Mom, you know, let me sit, sit you here and I'll feed you. I, I am a nurse and I'm experienced with this. And so she wasn't even opening her eyes. She was just opening her mouth and I was hmm. putting some, some soft food into her mouth. But all of a sudden she opened her eyes and she looked at me and she said, now I know why I named you Christine. Hmm. And I was just so surprised to hear that from my mother. That's the first time she ever told me that because my name means follower of Christ. That's the uh -huh. name that she gave me. Yeah. And I always knew that, you know, I used to go to church and pray. And that was always part of me, even though it wasn't mentioned by my mother. Because when I was named, my grandmother said, what kind of crazy name is that? <laughs> Christine, right? And, but then my mother said, well, her middle name is May. I'm naming her after you. And then, then it was okay with her. But I valued that because during my work as a nurse, even as a young nurse, I recognized spirit. For example, when I was 16, as I mentioned, I went to nursing school. And that year, the job of student nurses was to, to clean up the people who had passed away oh. and put them in the, in, the, in the shroud and put a little toe tag on the person. And so I was doing this with my classmates the, for the first time. And wow. you needed assistance because the people were very heavy. They were dead weight, literally. So you couldn't move them. So wow. I asked for this assistance from two of my classmates, but they were giggling the whole time we were, we were doing this. And I told them, this, the, per, the person's spirit is here, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so you have to consider that. So let's, let's be respectful here. So that was when I was fairly young. And so I learned how to work with death and dying because I was a nursing student. And of course, um, after I graduated at the age of 19, I was, I was in charge of a hospital unit, a 38 bed hospital unit by the age of 22. So I had to manage a whole floor of mainly older citizens who were bound to die because they, right. they were, they were in their nineties. And so, um, so always I, I wanted to be there and be with their spirit um, when they were going through that process, process of, of um, moving into the next, the next world. So I was always aware of that. 
and I think it's just a natural thing for me, um, you know, s- since I was very young. Right. I'm a student of Advaita Vedanta, which is um, is a Hindu philosophy, spiritual philosophy. Mm-hmm. They don't use the word spirit, but it's the same thing, pure consciousness mm-hmm. that's everywhere. It permeates mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. So even if it doesn't seem to uh, reflect life in the way we mm-hmm. understand, it's mm-hmm. still there. So everything mm-hmm. is sacred. Everything mm-hmm. is um, God, per se. Yes. That really connects with me when I when I think about spirituality in essence, exactly the way you see mm-hmm. that everything mm-hmm. is sacred. So how can we be unkind to anything? It's um, It's almost mm-hmm. like not mm-hmm. having understood that main principle mm-hmm. if we don't if we are unkind to anything of course it, it's uh, it sounds like a practice for the body mind right christine yes mm-hmm. it, it's incorporated it's incorporated it's when you're very young and yeah. and it's you know how do your parents respond what do your teachers say um how are you helped by strangers I remember when I was about eight years old, when I wrote about it in my book, in chapter 12, Keepers of the Trees, uh, I was, I was, I was sitting there with my, um, my friend on a tree limb, apple blossom tree, and it was so beautiful. And I went to smell the the blossom and I fell out of the tree, flat on my back, and I couldn't breathe. I, I knocked the wind out of my lungs. And I was just, I remember struggling and hearing it. My friend, she didn't know what to do. She was still up in the tree um, because we were young. And all of a sudden, a, a woman came up to me because I, as I was struggling to breathe. Now, this was on a street where there was no through traffic because it was a dead end on one. There was a vacant lot on one end. So very few cars came down that street unless you lived there. And very few, uh, very little foot uh, a passage by by adults children would play in the streets but adults wouldn't be out walking around so she came seemingly from nowhere and she helped me to breathe and then she took me home right to my house she said where do you live little girl and she brought me right to my home and rang the doorbell and my mother answered the door and she told her what happened and how she had helped and then she disappeared and i never saw her again mm-hmm. and i believed at the time she was my guardian angel mm-hmm. and so um, so all through my life, I can look back when I was saved uh, from something that could have happened, but I had a special purpose in life. And as I look back and like writing my book, I find all these incidents and say, oh my gosh, I didn't think of it that way, you know, when it happened, but I got through this experience or that experience. And one of the things it really came to fruition when I first started my work as a peak performance coach and opened my office at the Summit Center for Ideal Performance. It was just about a year in, and I had a very busy fall. I was taking hypnosis classes in Manhattan, and that was a couple of weeks. And at home, my husband was trying to prepare a Passover dinner for our children. He's Jewish, I'm Catholic, but I usually would help him with that. And so I came home from that class feeling kind of behind because my ch- my four children, they were in dance recitals and wrestling matches and gymnastics mm-hmm. <laughs> meets. And, and I also, because I studied tap dance, I studied tap dance and piano and violin um, while I was raising my children just uh-huh. to learn, learn these things. And so at any rate, I was tired. I was exhausted one day and I had to pick my four children up from school. They were all in separate schools. So I had to go around the town and pick them up. And in the nursery school, my daughter, if you didn't pick her up, you'd get a fine because it was a private school. You get a fine if you didn't get there on time. So at any rate, I'm thinking, okay, before I start this trek out there and I'm so Mm -hmm. tired and I have to focus uh, on my, my own dance recital, I took some ginseng tea it was a very special blend I bought in the supermarket. It had three from three different countries. One of them was from Russia. I don't remember what the origin of the other two. So I said, this is super duper <laughs> ginseng tea that's going to give me energy. So I made a cup of tea for myself and I sat down to drink it before I left the house. And as soon as I drank it, I felt something crawling across my back, like a big blob of something 
moving across my back. Mm -hmm. And I went into the bathroom and I looked and there was this huge hive, like this big on my back already, all red. And I thought, oh my goodness, and am having an allergic reaction. So I took some Benadryl because I did have to go out to the schools to pick up the children. And that seemed to help a little bit, but it kept on progressing. And by the time my husband came home from work, it, I had hives all over my body. Yeah. So he took me to the, the uh, storefront emergency clinic and they treated me there and they gave me um, epinephrine and all these different drugs. So I felt a little better. And it just so happened that right across the street from the clinic was the dance studio where I had to practice for my recital coming yeah, up in the next uh, two weeks. So I said to my husband, well, let's go across the street. I'll just sit there. I want, you know, just observe um, the, the, the yeah. uh, rehearsal. Yeah. I won't dance. So they had a chair. Then I was just watching <laughs> the, the whole thing and, and putting myself in the place and doing my own mental rehearsal of what I would actually do in, in the performance. But when I stood up, I collapsed on the dance floor, mm -hmm. flat on my back. And I went into anaphylactic shock right there on the dance floor. Mm -hmm. And I was totally out. And I saw angels in my mind. I was in a room with very white light and I was just floating. And it seemed so pleasant because I'm, I was thinking, I don't have to do anything. I can just rest here and float. It's so much fun, you know? And so, uh, so these two figures, and I believe they were angels, came on my left side and they talked to me about but, you know, you see that door over there in the, in the corner of the room? Well, why don't you go through that door? You know, you can go through that door and you can have this peace and serenity, like, forever. And I'm saying, like, what do you mean forever? What kind of door is that? You know, why should I go there? What will happen? And mm -hmm. I had the feeling they were asking me to pass over. Mm -hmm. So I said, wait yeah. a minute. I, I, I have this mission. I just started my work. I have my children. And they said, well, it's your choice what you do. So with that, I saw my children's faces come towards me one by one. It's like the vision coming up, mommy, mommy, stay with us, each one of them. And then the fifth person was my husband, who was hysterical, saying, come back. I, I can't do this without you. How am I going to raise the children? Mm -hmm. So with that, mm -hmm. I opened my eyes and I see my dance instructor over me he was he resuscitated me and these little ballerina these little girls with the leotards on and the ballet shoes they were all looking down at me on the dance floor and the name of the school was in the spotlight well I was surely in the spotlight mm. that day you know on the floor yeah. so I got very ill my husband took me to the emergency room in the hospital and I was vomiting the whole way there and I stayed in the hospital for three days with IV, Benadryl, and prednisone. So the, the hives continued, and the doctor said, I don't know why these are still growing within you. They were inside my body, outside. And so I was on prednisone for like six weeks, and it was really challenging. And I had, had challenges getting back on my feet, but I did use mental rehearsal, and I did get back to my dance recital. I performed in my dance recital three weeks later. Yeah, so it was wow. pretty amazing, and I did a great job too. <laughs> Yeah, that shows that um, that spiritual, you see, understanding of choice. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it really, I have mm -hmm. talked to so many people who have said the same thing. And we have mm -hmm. heard, some of us have heard that somewhere, that near-death experiences, that's what you just described. Yes. It's actually quite common. When I, I read the title of your book, um, uh, wrestling through adversity, empowering, empowering children, teens, and young adults, adults to win in life. So mm -hmm. that was my first question. Ah, oh, what does it mean to win in life? You know, what mm -hmm. would that look like? Mm -hmm. And then the more I listened to you, and of course, I read, went through your book, and then the resilience, of course, came to me. Mm -hmm. And then also yeah. being open to change, because mm -hmm. that's what it is, right? Death, mm -hmm. basically. It's exactly. a change. It's change, and change is really challenging as you get older. Yes. You, you have um, the mindset, and you, like you were talking earlier, that you had this, um, this ideation of, of ending your life. Yes. And you couldn't see anything else. You weren't able to see the picture of yourself being healthy and happy and, and, and uh, productive. And so 
so the idea is that um, you you live with something like that and you say you have to put up with it and you disregard that you could change into something else right. for whatever reason. Right. And it's just not the truth of it. You're just telling yourself you could be miserable at your job mm -hmm. like for 25 years and never change mm -hmm. because you're almost happy being miserable, right? Mm -hmm. But you, there's something that you could do. And, but as you get older, you, it, they say you can't teach old dogs new tricks. I say you can, but you have to work harder at it. At least I do as a peak performance coach, as well as my clients. Right. So, so yes, you can learn new things and cancel out those negative statements. That's called positive self-talk and thought stopping. You just cancel it out, um, delete it, erase it, right? You can even write down, uh, there's a process I bring my clients to on the left side uh, of the chart. You write down the negative thoughts, like I can't win. I'm a bad person, you know, I, I, um, I have uh, um, this bad disease, whatever it is, and you have to learn to cancel it and substitute positive words because the left side of the brain directs the right side. The left side is logical, is oriented towards what to do, making plans of action. Yeah. So you have to direct the right side to do the mental rehearsal and to get in the zone. So working with both sides of the brain is important. The words we say are important, but I do believe the pictures come first. The pictures mm. are, are there. It's like you see um, your opponent winning yeah. the wrestling match before you even walk onto the mat. You're saying, oh, look how big he is. And look, he's, he's reigned to state champion and he has big muscles and you're giving all your points away. I call them huh. um, points for peanuts for the wrestlers. Yeah. And they look at me and say, well, you're giving them away for free like they're peanuts. And huh. here you have skills as well. So this is before you even start the wrestling match. And I think that's very common. And then we believe that we move in that direction because the subconscious mind where all your skills are stored does not make a judgment. If you want to do it, fine. If you don't, Okay, but these skills are released automatically, like how to heal. It's automatic. We cut our finger. A mm, mom might say, yes. oh, it's okay. You know, let me kiss you, boo-boo, you know, and it gets better. <laughs> and it's automatic. So how can we have challenges healing physically? I'm not just talking about the, the body, mind, and spirit, but physically there's such a thing as delayed healing. And it's very frustrating to doctors. Like, why isn't this wound healing? And actually, it did happen to my husband when he fractured his leg. He had a compound fracture in three places um, from the knee down to the ankle. And it was a horrific experience for him. He slipped on ice. And compound fracture means that um, the bone comes through the skin. So he was sitting on the sidewalk. It was an icy sidewalk. And that's why he slipped. And his bone was literally on the concrete. And he was bleeding onto the ground and his uh, the police officer came and said let me straighten out his leg you know uh, it looks so crooked you know because it had didn't have the support of the bone i said no no i'm a nurse and i i stood there and i wouldn't let him do it he could introduce infection you know bacteria from yeah. the street literally and so he went to the hospital and sure enough he had frac fractured in three places and he had to have surgery he had the great surgeon who put this external device outside his leg to hold the bones together. Yeah. But after he went back to work, he was only there for six weeks because when he was home, he was home for some time. And I was able to help him actually do his work by using the power of his mind. And I used self-hypnosis and taught him what to do. He healed from that pretty well. He stopped bleeding. It started to heal. But when he went back to work, no way. He went to the doctor and it was all fragmented and he saw the x-ray and the, the bone wasn't connected. And the doctor said, I don't know what happened. You know, it should be healing. And he told them he should have a bone graft, but that's only effective 40% of the time. So he's an engineer, right? So he's thinking he's going to be in the 60 percentile and it's not going to heal. So I made him a self-hypnosis tape to listen to in his car pulled back and forth to work. And I brought him into a cave and I used imagery to help him to shore up all the, all the um, cracks with a spackle knife um, mm. and, and put a, a light, like a miner's light mm. on, to make sure he did all the cracks, filled them in. And, and also to listen to this audio 
um, tape that I made. And when he went back to the doctor three weeks later, it was completely healing from the inside out. So it really helped him um, and he was happy. If you ask him today, he, he says his leg is better than ever. He even believes that it grew, <laughs> that it grew in, in length because yeah. he had on even <laughs> length of legs. But, uh, but, um, but yes, it, he was able to heal um, from that along with relaxing and, and getting into the subconscious healing space that we all know, as I said, how to heal a body heals from a cut or from a wound, or even sometimes from a fracture. Um, I've had that happen also with some of my clients where they healed from the fracture and they didn't need surgery by using these techniques. Wow. I call that, I call that process operation heal. It's a program yeah. I've developed. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh gosh. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh my God, Christine, you're just a gift <laughs> to us all, to you and your mm -hmm. family, and then you're passing that on. How beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much for being you, for doing what you do. It's, uh, it's coming from that place of connection, connecting within, within your own self, body, mind, and spirit. I can, That's I can, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a beautiful presence. So your website is idealperformance.net. That's where to yes. find you. Mm -hmm. And all your programs, is everything there, um, Christine? Is there any other place that uh, the audience could try to find you? This is the website is the best place to go. Well, the, you can see um, my videos. One is on Operation Heal. You can get to that through my website. It's on YouTube. Uh, and all my other programs, Winning Ways for Teens. I made um, a TV uh, interview recording of that. And uh, uh, five, other, five other videos are on my website. But you can get to them um, by Dr. Christine Silverstein in my YouTube channel. And also, um, you can link in with me if you're a professional or you just want to link in with me. I write a weekly newsletter telling about stories, and I just wrote one for Christmas and how we can extend Christmas throughout the year, um, body, mm -hmm. mind, and spirit, and a story about my dad, who was very generous on a particular Christmas, and he gave our family's presents away to a poor family in, in a town, and how I remembered that it's so special as a Christmas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that way you can connect, and um, also to um, you can connect with me on my web through my website at Summit Center at optonline.net. That's my my um, email address, and also the Summit Center for Ideal Performance. You can connect with me that way as well. That's the name of my private practice. Ah, wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'll have your website and the YouTube channel too on this mm -hmm. podcast profile. Any other links too that I didn't have, I will ask you later. So mm -hmm. uh, we are almost at the end, and I do want. I love the um, the epilogue. So the phantom mm -hmm. limbs. Mm -hmm. I mean that that just, just caught my attention. Chapter twelve, as you mentioned, keepers mm -hmm. of the tree, and mm -hmm. no tree stands alone. It's actually mm -hmm. that. It just resonated so much that I have this as the title of this episode. I had to have it there. So thank you, um, thank you for yeah, that for understanding that <laughs> the meaning. Beautiful, of wow. So uh, the question is, I usually ask a question to my guests mm -hmm. at the end, but for you, um, I, I think let's try something else that I we I usually do too. Would you like to read a passage in your book, Christine? Any passages? I think I'll talk about the. In the introduction, and that's really the reason why I wrote the book. Yes. And I yes. wanted to read um, yeah. the introduction that's called Grappling with Life. Yes. And there's a quote here. It said, it says, at 8.46 a.m., the sound of the explosion came straight from hell, as if God had clashed together two symbols the size of mountains. The dreadful reverberation spewed auditory hate and lasted for what seemed like an eternity. And that was written by Phil Nowak in his book, Wrestling with Life, um, because he was at the 9-11 World Trade Center attack. So I start off in speaking, introducing people to my book. The words in the 1968 song, Everyday People by Sly in the Family Stone, remind us that no matter what group we're in, yellow, black, brown, red, or white, we got to live together with our families, our professions, our workplaces, and our communities. But sometimes we feel alone. Perhaps you are grappling with personal struggles that negatively impact the mental health of your children, teens, and young adults during 
catastrophic events such as terrorist attacks, wars, school shootings, and a pandemic that limit their growth and development. Maybe you have heard presidential table talk messages that grapple with the high prices of gasoline and groceries post-COVID-19. It seems that every day our problems spiral out of control and something's got to give before we implode like a ventless pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. You may feel overwhelmed, but do you know you can release the buildup of steam that gives you hope and the opportunity to grow? As I did, you too can learn mindful toughness skill sets provided in this book, like the athletes I work with as a peak performance coach. In this way, you can help yourselves and your family to become resilient from infancy to young adulthood. At times, you find yourselves in situations you did not personally create. From his youth as a wrestler to being a coach, Phil Nowick was such a person, and his life is emblematic of all our lives as he grappled through the 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center and subsequently died. However, in his memoir, Phil showed us how to sprint faster away from the towers when his lungs burned like wildfire. He showed us how to wrestle and overcome fear that sustained him through extreme exhaustion to make it through thick black smoke to safety. Mm. Phil, like many of us, wanted to climb the corporate ladder and was a junior investment banker at Merrill Lynch on 9-11. His offbeat qualities encumbered him when his Ivy League colleagues scorned his, his graduate education. He did not look the part either because of his shorter stature and his necklace physique as a wrestler. Phil was accused of being too nice and lacking a killer instinct, but had a gift for analysis and analytics. His major asset, however, was that he pointed out the truth as he saw it, which empowered me to write this book as you too can benefit. So you too can benefit. In fact, everyone who is inclined to read this book and gain more knowledge about themselves and others, whether they are a physician, soldier, CEO, farmer, teacher, butcher, banker, drummer, or teen can learn how to grapple with life. That's just incredibly beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing you and bringing wisdom, bringing healing um, wisdom to this realm. We do need to hear that. Be reminded too. Hear knowledge and just also be reminded. Thank you so much, Christine, for your presence. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, it was very enjoyable speaking with you. And you're a beautiful person. Oh, my God. So are you. Ah, what can <laughs> I say? <laughs> Thank you so much again. And we'll talk soon. Take good care. Bye for now, Christine. Bye for now.